Welcome to Red Grace Radio with Pastor Emilio Ramos. Red Grace Radio is a ministry of Red Grace Media. I am Robert Reese, and we are here to discuss everything evangelical, evangelistic, and reformed. Welcome, everybody, to Red Grace Radio. This is Emilio Ramos, and today we have a special uh, episode of Red Grace Radio. We are going to be interacting with a video that surfaced on the internet and was sent to us um, concerning Calvinism and uh, VBF Church, uh, especially uh, the two elders, uh, the pa- the senior pastor and the teaching pastor. Pastor Ron Vetti is the senior pastor of VBF Church and teaching pastor Jim Cruz. They interact with the doctrines of grace and they exhort their entire congregation to watch a video um, that they had recorded in one of their services where they address um, Calvinism in general. And the reason why I thought it was a good idea for us to maybe to walk through this, uh, this video and the audio of this video was because of the way they described Calvinism. These two pastors uh, really um, held nothing back in terms of describing Calvinism as heresy, describing Calvinism as demonic doctrine, and therefore, uh, and even calling out people like John Piper and the Gospel Coalition and different folks who, according to them, um, presumably believe in demonic doctrine. And so we thought it was a good idea to uh, interact with this video because so much of what is said erroneously on this video is what we often hear um, as Reformed folks and as those that believe in the doctrines of grace. When you talk to your non-Calvinist friends, people from uh, other denominations that Arminian, uh, Arminian denominations that reject the doctrines of grace, some of these um, stereotypical misconceptions of Calvinism are, is what people hold to, and it's kind of remarkable. It's it's sort of sad because um, it is it is very poor scholarship. It's very poor exegesis and very poor theology. So I thought we would go through uh, this entire uh, video step by step and just kind of listen to what is being said and then respond to it, hopefully in a meaningful way, and maybe even take a couple episodes to take care of this whole uh, this whole videotape. I, I regard this as a very brazen uh, slander of the Calvinist community uh, because it is a complete misrepresentation of what we believe uh, in the first place. So I thought it was good for us to interact with it. So let me just, uh, we're going to play the first clip, and then um, at some point here, I'm just going to break in and begin to comment on it. So let's look at this first clip. Uh, Before I pray, I feel like the Apostle Paul tonight uh, in the fact that there was bad doctrine going around the church. People were accusing the Apostle Paul, and they were saying, you know, you're not really an apostle, on and on. And he said, you know, I hate to do what I'm doing, but I'm going to have to boast a little bit. He said, boasting is not even good, but man, you're forcing me to do it. And he went on to talk about all the signs of God in his life and, and how that God was doing all this stuff. Charlie Garcia, when I tell you, I let's mean, uh, this let's guy. Let's just stop it right there for a second, um, because the next couple of minutes on what he's talking about really is not very relevant, but... Um, uh, just to introduce the tenor of what he's saying there um, is really just indicative of the way the whole video goes on. It's a very non-specific, non-critical approach to the Bible, and so even the reference that he made there to the Apostle Paul and people undermining his apostolic ministry is done in just a very haphazard type of way. Nothing too specific is given, and that really is the way the whole video is done. It's done in a very... Um, uh, basically an emotion type driven, you know, message that is meant more than anything just to try to get uh, a, a rise out of the, the congregation and try to f- try to rally everybody behind what the pastors are saying in the name of, well, we really love you. These folks are unloving and they're all wrong. And, um, you know, we know that we know that you're not going to fall for that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like a good old boy sort of network. Here's a backslapping, you know, uh, it, it, it's sort of a, it's it, it, it's sort of just a, um, a, a tactic 
to try and uh, manipulate people, not with um, engaging the subject in any critical way, but the whole video is done like this. It's very general, generic statements that are given, non-critical statements, and so that's kind of what we can expect. So convicted by God. He blew through it, got convicted, stopped, backed his car all the way up, <laughs> and then went up to it again and stopped and said, God, I'm doing this because that's the law, and you're pleased when I, when I keep the law. He went on stopped his car and backed up again and went to it and stopped. So this second time is totally for you. And they said, from that day forward, God said, with that kind of obedience, I can trust you and I'll start blessing you. And it went on from there. Jim and I, we're going to address a doctrine tonight. And I, I'm really, I'm not happy I'm having to do this, but I have to do it. There's a doctrine that many churches in Bakersfield believe in. A lot of young pastors believe in. And this doctrine is the ugliest doctrine I've ever seen in my life. Now, before you get down on us, we don't want to hear negativism. We've been called to stand up against heresy. We're commanded to do that as shepherds. I'm going to show you something. Hold on to your seat. I want to show you a picture of a few little cute babies. Everybody love babies? Stop right there for a second because of what he has already introduced, um, the, the basically the poisoning of the well of what's already happened, you know, is that <clears throat> Pastor Vetti here has already sort of poisoned the mind of his hearers, saying, look, what I'm getting ready to introduce to you is something so bad and so dangerous, something we have to expose. I don't even want to do it. But then he says that God calls him to expose doctrine. But you know, what's really sad about this is that what follows, in my opinion, is a complete abdicating of pastoral duty, which is to rightly divide the word of truth, which he does not do. And and ultimately, it's a complete contradiction to what he's saying that God is calling him to do. But um, as you can tell, the tenor, the, the tone, uh, Calvinism is being described as a rank heresy and something that is just dangerous from the pit of hell. The way he's describing it is it's the worst theology that has ever been. So, And then he's going to appeal to the congregation by showing them a series of baby pictures. Take a look at some of these pictures, if you will. <laughs> look at there. Who doesn't like baby wow. pictures? Quadruplets. <laughs> Don't you love babies? I thought there's two ugly ones. Oh, that's us. That's us. Uh, the doctor we're going to share with you tonight. Here's what this doctrine says. The majority of those babies were created by God with the intentions that they were going to burn in hell. Let's stop right there, because obviously that's a, <clears throat> you know, that, that's totally designed. I mean, that is the way that he is crafting his argument is through an emotional appeal. I mean, who cares what the Bible says? He begins by showing you a picture of a cute baby and then making God, making God out to be a complete monster who would create these cute babies just for the purpose of damning them to hell, you know? And obviously the implication there is that God is responsible for the baby's unbelief. Uh, there's no, as a matter of fact, there's no discussion of that at all. So no articulation whatsoever of what the Bible actually teaches regarding the doctrine of predestination. And, um, you know, I have news for Pastor Ron Vetti and for Jim Cruz is that God does not do what he does for the purpose of either damning or saving. He does what he does for the purpose of his glory. And it doesn't surprise me that they don't have a consistent view of who God is and of his sovereignty if they don't have God's glory as the preeminent motive for which God does all things. And so God, 
um, is first and foremost concerned with his glory, which of course is something that these gentlemen are unwilling to accept. And they are unwilling to embrace the teaching of Scripture that teaches that God has vessels for honor, vessels for dishonor, that we have no right to question the potter, what he does with the clay. There's no discussion of that at all. The discussion is just a, it's a fear-mongering discussion. It's an attempt to try to paint God as this evil monster by misrepresenting the doctrine of election. And and uh, throughout the video, you're going to hear a, kind of a contradiction here because they make it sound like they make it sound like the vast majority of people were created to be damned, and and then they they want to make it they want to make Cal, accuse Calvinists of believing that just a very slight few people are going to be saved, you know, which of course is not the Calvinist position. We believe that an innumerable amount of people are going to be in heaven. But then he goes on to admit that Jesus himself taught that, uh, you know, the way that leads to life is, is hard and few will be there that find it. And so they even go on to admit that, relatively speaking, com in comparison to the population of everyone who has ever lived, uh, less people will end up going to heaven than people that will go to hell. And so I don't see how any of this even helps them, to be quite honest. But we'll get to the... We'll get to the inherent contradictions in their arguments here in a minute. And it, he will be glorified when they're burned in hell. Well, stop right there. Wrong. Let, let, let's, just, let's just be clear about something. God is glorified in the death of the wicked. Uh, he's going to quote a passage out of Ezekiel. Um, he talks, he, he, he refers to Ezekiel's words where he says that God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. However, there's a parallel in the book of Lamentations that also says God does not take pleasure, does not from his heart afflict the sons of men, but he does afflict them. <laughs> so in the same sense, God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. However, he does put the wicked to death. And so those types of fast and loose dealings with scripture really ultimately do him no good. Also, I would point out that for Pastor Ron Vetti, he has no capacity to see how the damnation of anyone will result to the glory of God. So then the question is, is does damnation at all, does hell result to the glory of God or not? Does it, as the Apostle Paul would say, magnify his justice, his wrath? And I wonder how they would even reconcile such a thing, that people will be destroyed away from the presence of the Lord, and that this is in order to magnify an attribute of God, namely his wrath and his justice, which is ultimately, therefore, to his glory. To his glory, because he deals with his enemies, he punishes sin, and all of that is glorifying to God. Wrong with a capital W. This doctrine is called Calvinism. And me and Jim's going to address it tonight. And uh, I want to start out by saying one thing. There's a lot of Calvinistic churches in Bakersfield. I'm not going to name them. My war is not against them personally. It's against a doctrine that is horrible. Well, th Their let's, doctrine just, state let's just consider the merit of what he just said there, right? If Calvinism is as evil, to use his words, as demonic, to use his words, as rank heresy, or as heresy, I forgot exactly how he put it, but he uses the word heresy. If it is, in fact, as evil as he claims, and yet he doesn't care enough about his people to tell them the names of the churches in the area that they may not be aware uh, in terms of who is teaching this damnable heresy, I mean, if you put it in the level of damnable heresy, demonic doctrine, then what you're saying is that the Calvinist church down the street is equivalent to the Jehovah Witness church down the street, or the, 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 the Kingdom Hall, or, the, or the, the Mormon ward. Certainly, you would tell your people about the Mormon ward down the street, and you would identify it and tell them where it is and what they teach. So this is gross inconsistency here on the part of Ron Vetti, because... On the one hand, he's warning his people of this 
of this heinous evil, this this doctrinal danger, and yet he's completely unwilling to identify where the problem is. What kind of a shepherd tells the people there is such a grave danger around the corner that it, it will damn you if you believe in that, but I won't tell you what it is specifically. I mean, you know, to me, it is just a complete dereliction of duty in a very ironical type of way because that's what he claims uh, Calvinism is, but yet he doesn't follow through with what a shepherd should do with heresy. So it's just it's just kind of a, a, a walking contradiction here. It's basically, and it's their dirty little secret they don't want everybody to know. Because the Bible says the road is broad that leads to destruction, and the road to life is narrow and few find it. We know the Bible teaches that compared to the, the percentage of people on the earth, very few are going to be saved. But their doctrine states, now I know the doctrine, it states that God only chooses a few. He only chooses some to have eternal life. Well, His well, right there we should, we should just pause and remember, remember that it was the Lord Jesus himself who said, many are called, few are chosen. But there is a mass misunderstanding in what he's in what he's saying here. On the one hand, he's saying God only chose a few, but he's not qualifying that with what the Bible actually teaches in terms, again, of an innumerable multitude of people who will be saved. Innumerable, myriads upon myriads of people will be saved in the end. So, this is a complete caricature, um, almost getting it to the point, what Pastor uh, Ron Vetti is saying here is almost getting it to the point that that almost what he's saying is that, you know, Calvinists only believe that such a small few group of people will be saved, almost characterizing it as if only the Calvinists will be saved. I mean, you know, he's almost, he's almost insinuating that Calvinists believe only Calvinists will be saved. That it's just a small group of people that believe like them. Um, that that's the problem when you're not specific. That's the problem when you're not critical. Is that you make these sweeping generalizations that have no grounding in reality, and therefore you misinform your people. That's why I tweeted earlier this week how to misinform your church. This is how you do it right here. This video shows you how to misinform a church, and um, these pastors are. These pastors are greatly accountable for what they've done and for and for coming out and putting out uh, such a deplorable video like this. But um, sadly, it only gets worse. Decision is only based on whatever. We don't know I, what it's based on. We need to stop right there because um, what Pastor uh, Ron Vetti is saying, and the more he talks, the harder time I have calling him pastor. But I will, out of respect... Um, what Ron Vetti is saying there is that God chooses people, and then he says, on the basis of what we don't know, who knows why he chooses people? <laughs> so he's basically saying God has no reason why he chose the elect. And of course, we know why he chose the elect. He chose the elect to be for the praise of the glory of his grace, which is found in Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, let me just read the, the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us to adoption through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. And so verse 6, I think, is giving us the result and purpose of why God does this. He does it to magnify his grace. The redeeming of a peculiar people in Christ is for the magnifying of the glory and grace of our of, of, of God. That's why he does it. And I'm very sorry to hear that Pastor Ron has no idea why God elects his people. That is really, really sad. And it really accounts for much of his theological problems here. He chooses some to be saved. He chooses others to be born with the intention that they will suffer in hell forever and ever, and God is glorified in that suffering. Well, yes, uh, God is glorified 
in uh, both the election of his people and in the non-election of of the vessels of wrath, as Paul uh, calls them in Romans chapter 9. He is glorified in both because it's a complete display of both the grace and the wrath of God. This is, I mean, this gets to a kind of a deeper issue, even in our culture, in our evangelical culture even, the the whole uh, God is nothing but love doctrine, which we've addressed here before. Um, and I, I wrote a, blo- a blog talking about the love of God and how it's been abused and how people have, uh, by using the love of God, they have in essence nullified all his other attributes, which is idolatry. Because you can't take one attribute and trump all of the other attributes of God and then expect to have the real uh, picture, the picture, the real character of God in the end. <laughs> you can't nullify uh, God's uh, attributes with one attribute, one particular attribute that you decide to magnify. And of course, they always magnify his love, which they don't understand. God's love, as I articulated in that blog post that I wrote, um, I think the blog, po- blog post was entitled something like Love Unrelinquished or something like that. And I pointed out that God's love is actually covenantal love. And it's covenantal love because it's a special redemptive love that he places on his elect people. And so the very love of God that Ron Vetti is basically uh, trying to magnify here works against him actually in the pages of Scripture because God's love is sovereign love. It is re- it is covenantal love, and it is redemptive love. It is not this nebulous, undefined, this general love for all people in the same way as He loves all of His people, and that is a very poor understanding of the love of God. A horrible, horrible doctrine. I want to tell you something tonight. God loves everybody. Listen to me. God is not the kind of God that says, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I'll pick you, 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 the rest of you. I created you with the intention of burning in hell. Well, obviously, and I will be obviously those kind of caricatures, I mean, just kind of, again, reinforce everything that, that, um, that I've been saying here in terms of for Pastor Ron, um, the electing love of God is a random, erratic choice of God. God doesn't do it for any specific reason. Um, election is just kind of a random, schizophrenic choice that God makes for no apparent good reason whatsoever. Uh, God is God is rolling the dice up there. He's just basically saying, look, let's play a meeny, miny, mo, uh, a game, and... Um, and let's see who I end up choosing in the end. I mean, this is about as irresponsible of a way that you can handle this um, these these type of great teachings. But we'll continue to interact with this video here on the other side of the break. This is Emilio Ramos with Red Grace Media. I want to talk to you today about the Compelled Conference with Hearts for the Lost. Compelled is a large format conference that provides your church with biblical evangelism training and equips your congregation to become active in the local church's community outreach. If you have an interest in hosting a Compelled Conference, please see my friends at heartsforthelost.com for further details. This is Pastor Emilio with Heritage Grace Community Church. If you're in the Dallas area and you're looking for a church that focuses on expository preaching, heartfelt worship, and meaningful fellowship, please come and join us at Heritage Grace Community Church, located in Frisco, Texas, on the corner of Coit and 121. Hope to see you there. Well, welcome back, everybody, to Red Grace Radio. We are doing a special episode of Red Grace Radio today. We are examining uh, the video that was recently released by uh, a a church uh, in Bakersfield. Uh, The name of the church is called VBF Church, and uh, I think they have a couple campuses. I don't know if this is if this was done in their Vegas campus or one of their um, one of their um, Bakersfield uh, locations, but they refer to the Calvinist churches in Bakersfield and how there's this great problem. And so these two pastors are going to refute 
this evil doctrine of Calvinism. This is Pastor Ron Vetti and uh, teaching Pastor Jim Cruz, and this is their response to a big problem that they see, uh, which is the emergence of of Calvinist churches in the area that are a great threat and that pose a great danger to the people. And so they are going to uh, refute what he just called an awful doctrine. And so uh, uh, let's just continue walking through the statements that are made here so far. Glorified as you burn. You say that's not really, that is the doctrine. Is that not the, that is the doctrine now? Yeah. Um, this has become kind of a, a hot button for Pastor Ron and I both uh, uh, in, in, I guess, the church world. Uh, we have to deal with critics uh, from other people and other pastors and other ministers. And, and I was sharing this with Ron the other day. I, I kind of feel like we're that kid in the playground. that We're just happy to be on the playground and we're just we're having fun. And this bully comes over and just kind of shoves us and we're like, Knock it off, man. I'm just playing. You know, I'm, you should play too, you know? Well, I don't think the analogy um, is meant to be very critical, and I understand that, but the analogy is poor nonetheless. Because, of course, ministry is not a playground. And this analogy to me um, may be sort of indicative of the way that these people approach the whole concept of ministry that they're just doing their ministry thing. They're just on the playground having fun. And that people like those nasty Calvinists, they want to take the Bible so serious and so critical that they dare to criticize us, they dare to push us around doctrinally. And of course, all that that means is that Calvinists think critically about Scripture. It is so obvious that these two pastors do not think critically at least not on this video, um, they they don't think very critically about Scripture. But the analogy of ministry and pastoral ministry to kids playing on a playground is a very, very poor and unfortunate analogy. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, Timothy, be sober in all things. Um, Paul warns the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, that after my departure, savage wolves are going to come in. Ministry is anything but a playground. It is a battleground. It is not a playground. It's wartime mentality. It's not playtime. And so that to me was a bit telling of where the perspective of these two so-called pastors really is coming from. Is, is ministry for them a self-serving exercise, or is ministry for the glory of God in the and and in in faithfulness to the teaching of Scripture? I mean, God knows the heart, but I just thought the analogy was very poor, of course, to them. Calvinists are the mean bullies on the playground, pushing everybody around. No, we we should have fun. We're on the playground, and and you just play a little bit longer, and he comes over and he pushes you again. You're like, all right, I'm just going to tell you one more time. You do this again, and it's on like Donkey Kong, all right? All right, you got this? And so I feel like we're that, that kid on the playground that keep getting pushed around uh, with this doctrine that has become very popular uh, by uh, guys like John Piper uh, with uh, organizations like Acts 29, the Gospel Coalition, and uh, this uh, resurgence uh, reformation movement. And I, I feel as though we're, we're that school kid that's been pushed around, and we, we just want to speak on the love of God because we feel like that is the prominent message of the Bible. And so we want to we specifically teach on that, but these guys keep shoving us around to where, okay, it's gaining popularity and it needs to be spoken against because... Well, I mean, right there, he espouses this love hermeneutic that I'm talking about which is so detrimental to anybody doing exegesis and doing biblical exposition and biblical study at all. It's detrimental to a church to say that the the prime hermeneutic or the prime teaching of scripture what he is basically what he has adopted basically 
is a reductionistic approach to the Bible, which is actually a liberal hermeneutic of the Bible, to try to reduce the Bible down to just one simple message, one simple metaphor, even one word, one idea, love. The whole Bible from cover to cover, love, and that's it. That's all you need to know. And so that's the way that they would train and teach their people. The most important thing, man, is that you know love, and that's it. Nothing else matters. Forget about the specifics of the gospel and what the gospel is exactly, and forget about the inspiration of scripture and all of that. You know, just as long as you maintain a high level of love, espouse Christian love, advocate for Christian love, live in Christian love. Um, But of course, what this pastor fails to understand, according to Paul's definition of love, is that love... Uh, does no wrong to a neighbor. Love does not rejoice in uh, unrighteousness. We are called not to love in hypocrisy. And so everything about our love doctrine better be informed by the truth. It better be informed by what is actually pleasing to God, which is the will of God, the word of God. And so it's just a sad dichotomy that is being put up here. Ultimately, it pits scripture against scripture. But you heard the names that he named. He named Piper. He talked about Acts 29. They tend to be somewhat Calvinistic. Uh, I know that um, I know that Mark Driscoll is not a five-point Calvinist. He is an Amaraldian. In my opinion, that is a that is a, um, a deficient view of the of the doctrine of limited atonement, and it is not historic Calvinism. So okay, I understand they are very Calvinistic. Um, and some of the other uh, movements like the Gospel Coalition that he mentioned, and that they are the bullies. Well, I mean, let me just sort of be frank here. I mean, when I go to the Gospel, the Gospel Coalition, they are anything but uh, they are anything but bullies on the Gospel Coalition. I mean, I tend to think the Gospel Coalition kind of needs to step up their Calvinism a little bit. They tend to be extremely, extremely. Uh, you know, a political and, um, you know, non-threatening in much of what they say and do. So I don't really understand uh, why he decided to focus on on, on uh, the Gospel Coalition. Perhaps it's because he has interacted with some Acts 29 pastors in the area that uh, that that are pointing him to the Gospel Coalition. And, you know, but ultimately, um, the Calvinist community have, has apparently bullied these two pastors into the corner, and now they're ready to get it on, as he says. They're, it's time to get it on. So let's see if they can get it on. Uh, in, in my mind, and, and I may uh, stand a little bit more uh, on this side than even Pastor Ron does, but in my mind, uh, this doctrine is blasphemous, it's unbiblical, and it's heresy, and I believe it's a doctrine of demons. It has marred the image of my father. I told Jim on the way out. It's like someone is blaspheming my father. And they're knocking him and saying he's cruel. And he's like a heathen God. And I'm angry. That's my dad. Let me tell you something. God, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish and have everlasting life. Of course, that is the that is the um, that is going to be the verse um, that many Arminian type folks will always quote. And as you can see, it gets a big applause and it, it, it gets everybody riled up. It's a big rah rah moment uh, because, of course, John three sixteen is. You know, everybody knows John 3.16 refutes Calvinism. Well, of course it does not. If you look carefully at John 3.16 um, in the Greek, it is very clear that John 3.16 has been mistranslated by most translation, basically for traditional reasons, beginning with the King James. Um, it is not an indefinite construction in the Greek language. It is not, the Greek New Testament is actually a participial construction. It's not an indefinite construction. It does not mean that whosoever, um, but of course, by that time, you have lost people that are so inundated by, um, by the tradition of the translation of this passage 
that actually Ponton Pistuon could not possibly mean what John wrote it to mean, which John wrote all those believing or all the believing ones. Um, that would never fly in a context like this. They would never allow God, the, the apostle John to get up in front of them and tell them, uh, actually, um, uh, you know, a ponton pastuon does not mean whosoever. Um, they would probably lynch the Apostle Paul or the Apostle John for coming up there and correcting them about what he actually wrote. And it just shows you how ingrained evangelicals are at times with their evangelical traditions. But you heard Pastor Jim. You heard Pastor Jim's um, uh, his assessment of what Calvinism is. It is demonic. It is heresy. It is... It is beyond the pale. It is it is evil. It turns God into a monster. It is blasphemous. And so these guys are definitely not uh, pulling any punches. If they've read any of Roger Olson's stuff, they're definitely following in his steps and maybe even speaking a bit more vitriolic even than him. Listen, God loves all of you. You homosexuals, God loves you. You gangsters, God loves you. You strippers, God loves you. I hate to say it, but you Calvinists, God loves you too. Uh, He loves everybody. He loves you and you and you and you. See? Well, before he goes on to that next point, um, of course, um, of course, Calvin, historic Calvinism has always taught a responsible doctrine of the love of God. Jesus loved the rich young ruler when he walked away. He looked at him, and he loved him. And there is a general love for all people, especially within the context of common grace. Um, Perhaps hyper-Calvinists would deny that. I would not. I would stay within more of a historic um, tradition on that, uh, that God has. But that has more to do with God's benevolent love, not God's redemptive love, not his covenantal love. And so uh, even though God does love all mankind in this general fashion, that does not mean that God loves all mankind the same. That is a very irresponsible way to, to talk about the love of God. Because of course, covenant love, redemptive love is special love. Uh, Jesus' love for his bride is not the same as his love for uh, for all people. Um, that would be like telling a bridegroom that loves everybody in his community that how could he love his bride in a special way that he doesn't love other people's brides? Well, of course, that's because his love to his bride is a covenant love. It is a love that binds them together in a special union. And of course, we cannot expect this kind of theological specificity from pastors uh, who are making it very clear from the outset that they don't want to deal with this issue responsibly, but they want to deal with it emotionally. They want to, de- they want to deal-, deal with it philosophically, psychologically, but not emotionally, not, not biblically. Fuse. To come to a place where we go, I'm chosen, but the rest of the world go to hell. I don't care. This is going to be. Gotta, this is actually going to begin to um, get into another major misunderstanding from both of these so-called pastors, and that is that elect people. Number one, they those who have assurance of their election, uh, seemingly according to these folks, have assurance of people's non-election. <laughs> That's basically what they're saying, which tells me the absolute abject ignorance that these folks are approaching the subject matter with, if they understand anything from any good Calvinist theologian whatsoever, they would understand that no Calvinist theologian has ever taught that he or she can see the elect status of anyone, not even other believers. We may have a general confidence in people's election, but we do not actually see people's elect status. 
we we are not able to identify the elect. And so that shows me right there that these folks are completely misunderstanding uh, Calvinism, what Calvinists believe, the doctrine of election. They're, they're misunderstanding um, the Calvinist position on what it means to be assured of your election, which, of course, it does not mean uh, that you have assurance of other people's election. So they're going to chase this trajectory a little bit, and we'll get to this uh, on the other side of another another break here. So hang tight. This is Emilio Ramos with Red Grace Media. I want to talk to you today about my friends at Hearts for the Lost. Hearts for the Lost is a biblical evangelism conference ministry that focuses on equipping your church with biblical teaching and evangelism training. Let's face it, there are still tons of folks in the church who do not know how to evangelize biblically. The Hearts for the Lost team and the Compelled Conferences are a great way to get your church's evangelism off the ground. This year I'll be in Lexington, Kentucky on October 25th. I'll be joining the Hearts for the Lost team for the Compelled Conference. Please, if you have not yet, consider joining us. I promise you it will be an encouraging time for you and your whole family. If you have not had the Hearts for the Lost team come out to your church and put on a compelled conference, please consider partnering with Hearts for the Lost. The best part about this ministry is that the compelled conferences are absolutely free. I don't think there could be a better conference partnership than that. Please visit heartsforthelost.com for further details. Our mission here is to spread the gospel with our clothing and way of life. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh who came to save sinners. He died on the cross and rose three days later, defeating death for those who would turn from their sins and trust in him. Our desire, God will use wrath and grace as a tool to save the lost. Our hope, bring glory to God, man. What you think? Or something else? Man, I don't know. The scriptures say we are not to be ashamed of his message. And what better way than to use our clothing as the way to witness? Now you can preach the gospel and wear it too. Stop by wrathandgrace.com and join the movement. It's, it's, it's all wrath and grace as we know as Christians. And this business is consistent with the whole scripture. Well, welcome back, everybody. We are... Uh, engaging this video that came out uh, of uh, VBF Church with pastors uh, Ron Vetti and Jim Cruz. Um, these folks are uh, claiming to expose uh, Calvinism for what it really is, and in doing so, they have given uh, a quite a reprehensible rep, rep, misrepresentation of Calvinism and um, and uh, what it teaches, and complete characterizing Calvinism as a heretical doctrine, damnable, blasphem, blasphemous, and uh, it's really uh, it's really amazing to see uh, the language that's being used here, especially with such an erroneous presentation of the doctrines of grace and the Calvinist tradition. But uh, let's continue uh, looking at this next um, statement by Pastor uh, Ron, because they're going to begin to talk about the fact that elect people apparently can tell who non-elect people are. So let's listen to this next clip. Uh, message from uh, Rod Jones that comes here and speaks. And he says, Ron, to support what you're doing tonight, I was meeting with 20 pastors a while back. And we were talking about evangelism. And the one guy from a certain denomination says, my church says evangelism is a waste of time because God already knows who's going to be saved and who isn't. So we don't evangelize. Well, right there, I mean, you know, again, we already know, God already knows who's going to be saved and therefore we don't evangelize. And so he, you know, kind of a different subject here, but another occasion to misrepresent what Calvinism teaches, of course, um, God knows who already is going to be saved because God has already ordained who's going to be saved, and God has uh, chosen those whom he will save. Uh, but that has never, ever been an incentive against evangelism. This is the same problem that the Southern Baptists uh, have 
uh, and the, the same error they've made over and over again, thinking that the doctrines of grace are somehow antithetical to evangelism. Of course, it is not. And um, I actually point much of this out in my book, Convert from Adam to Christ. I talk about the gospel, and I talk about Paul's understanding of, of, of the gospel and how the Apostle Paul, even though he understood election, it never, it never um, caused him to shy away from the task of evangelism. As a matter of fact, I would argue that the Apostle Paul used election as an incentive for evangelism because precisely because he knew that there were people who were elect precisely for that reason, the Apostle Paul would engage in evangelism, going so far as to say in 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse 10 that uh, for this reason, he says, um, I endure all these things for the sake of the elect so that they may obtain salvation. So, um, very clearly, for Paul, election was a evangelistic incentive. It was not a deter a, a deterrer of evangelism. It did not deter his evangelism, discourage his evangelism in any way whatsoever. So, yet another misrepresentation by these two pastors. Did you understand that this doctrine that God has already chosen, He's already chosen the people are going to be saved. And it's a minority. So probably I can't put a percentage on, but the largest percentage of Bakersfield. They don't have any decision about this. They have not been chosen. They can't do anything about it. They can't change their, I mean, it's done. It's done. So some of your loved ones, they have not been chosen. And they can't change that. By the way, they cry. I, I think we need to, um, I think we need to use Pastor Ron's logic here against him. Does he believe that he can save people? Does he believe that by his effort, he can produce conversion. It sounds like he believes the opposite of what um, Calvinism teaches, at least his misunderstanding of what Calvinism teaches, that because God has an elect people, then we should not evangelize anybody because they've already been chosen. So he just doesn't understand that God ordains the ends as well as the means to the ends. So God ordains the evangelistic cause, the evangelistic means that will bring about his sovereign end, the election and the salvation of his elect people. But let's try to understand it from Ron's perspective. Okay, if people are not elect, if people are not predestined, then that means that it's up to us to save people it's up to us to make them chosen people. And so here's my question for Pastor Ron. Pastor Ron, why are you sleeping at night? Why do you, why, why have you visited every neighbor on your street with the gospel? Are you banging down the door of every person in your community? Are you chasing down every relative that you have ever had? Are, do you love them enough? Since salvation apparently lies within your power, what are you doing engaging in anything other than the salvation of other people? If you have within yourself the ability to convert these people, if everyone does have the ability to be saved based on their choice and not based on God's sovereign election, then why aren't you out trying to make people choose? Why aren't you out trying to get people to exercise their free will and to save themselves? You see, this, this is kind of a, a double-edged sword. It runs both ways. And I think it cuts uh, worse, obviously, for the Arminian. The Arminian would basically have us to believe that salvation is not of the Lord. Salvation is of man. That salvation is wholly contingent upon what we do. And so this is where decisionism comes in. If we can just manipulate people into a decision, well, then they will be elect based on their decision. Because remember, in Arminianism, um, God's election is contingent upon man's choice. So man chooses, and then God chooses him. Um, and that is what he's actually foreseen in the future. But of course, that is not what foreknowledge means at all. And that is not the way that God's sovereign election works at all. 
So it's just, to me, an amazing hypocrisy on the part of this pastor to suggest, oh, don't evangelize anybody uh, because they've already been chosen. Um, but yet he would not own up to his own position, which would say, well, because everyone has the potential to be saved, therefore we should try to evangelize everybody. Is he evangelizing everybody? I really wonder about that. How much time does he spend in evangelism? How much time does he spend preaching the gospel? How many tracts does he pass out? How many doors is he knocking on personally? Does he not care? Does he leave that to his church? Does he hide away in his in at, in his home at night while people are perishing? Does he care? According to him, he has the power to waken them. It's within their ability and it's within his grasp. So why wouldn't he do it? It's just total hypocrisy. Out to God all they want, but they have not been chosen. They have been created to be burned in hell forever and ever and ever. Now he now, he made a statement there where he says people can cry out to God all they want, but because they've been chosen, because they haven't been chosen, they'll burn in hell forever. And of course, that is a complete oxymoron. The non-elect will not cry out to God. <laughs> God's sovereign, uh, his choice to pass over the non-elect is con is congruent with their willful rejection of him anyway. So it's not like God is creating in people a decision to reject him. It's not like God is creating in the hearts of the non-elect a fresh evil or a fresh rebellion that they themselves don't possess, that left to themselves perhaps they wouldn't have. God had to put that rebellion, that unbelief into them. That is not what Calvinism has ever taught. It is God's choice to allow a certain group of people fallen in Adam, not in Christ, and therefore not elect, to go their own course and to perish because of that. Again, we're not talking about some... There's dozens of churches in Bakersfield that teach this. They keep it quiet. I can name some and you go, oh, yes. Now listen, I know. I told Jim before we come out here. I know what I'm doing by talking about this tonight. If you can't kill the message, kill the messenger. I know I'm setting myself up. You're going to see on the internet and everywhere else. This guy, they're going to try to come against me personally with everything they have. Well, there's, the, the there's, there's no personal attack here. Um, I don't know uh, Pastor Ron personally. Um, I'm sure he's a very nice man. Uh, this is not a personal attack against him whatsoever. This is an objective analysis of the statements that he has made regarding my faith. And so uh, this is, this is of course, you know, uh, here Pastor Ron sort of victimizing himself a little bit, you know, it's like, oh, just be ready for the hate, the haters to come out of the woodwork and begin to throw stones at me, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but Pastor Ron, let me just say this, um, for you to put out such an irresponsible misrepresentation of a of such a historic doctrinal position um and to call people out by name people like John Piper the gospel coalition these folks uh with with whom I agree in terms of calvinism um what did you expect would happen if you were coming out in public now putting this on the internet and on video for all to see uh, what did you expect to happen? Uh, so this is this is something that obviously you have done without a responsible thought process of what would be the repercussions of you doing something like this. And now, um, of course, you have to face the consequences of what you've done, which is to misrepresent an entire section of the body of Christ um, in a very ungodly fashion because you you are slandering people. Uh, of believing things that we do not believe. And therefore, it is incumbent upon us to respond to your presentation, hopefully in a meaningful way. The minority of the church, not the majority, but they're gaining momentum, and there's dozens of churches in Bakersfield. But first thing they're going to do is kill the messenger. So I know I'm setting myself up for that, but I love people so much that I don't care. If I get killed, I get killed, okay? And the second thing they're going to do... 
They're going to say we don't understand the message. We do understand it totally. Well, obviously, obviously there, I mean, it just boils down to historical facts, exegesis. Um, uh, it, it just boils down to to the theological historicity of Calvinism, um, which history obviously would refute everything that uh, these two uh, men here are espousing about Calvinism. Um, so, of course, they do not understand the message. They do not understand election. They don't. They do not understand reprobation. They do not understand uh, God's decree. They do not understand. Uh, the, the 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 purpose for which God created the world in the first place they don't understand the way that um, the way that regeneration works apparently the way that salvation works uh, so yes it is a not only did these pastors not only did these pastors reveal that they don't understand what Calvinism teaches they reveal they they reveal to us that they don't even understand how salvation what salvation teaches. They don't even understand what the Bible teaches regarding salvation and regeneration and those types of things. Those kinds of things we will engage in as uh, we continue to interact with this video. Let's just get a couple more clips in. So I know that's going to happen. Now, here's what you do. If you have people that are trying to get you to go to another church or you even visit another church, ask them one thing because they'll have to answer this. Do you believe in divine election the way John Calvin believed in it? I want to say it again for you. You ask other Christians and you ask them, do you believe in divine election the way John Calvin believed in it? It's a yes or no question. But they won't answer with a yes. They'll go, well, what we mean, that's what they'll, once they say that, conversation's over. Okay, so the, Calv the conversation is not over um, because many Calvinists, like myself, would say, yes, of course I believe in election the way that John Calvin believed in it. Of course I do. Uh, maybe with a few exceptions. I mean, no one, I mean, you can take our, uh, theologians from every tradition. Not every theologian believes every particular of every other theologian. But in a general way, yes, in a general consensus, I do agree with Calvin's understanding of election. I would say to somebody from his church, if they were to ask me that question, is first, why don't you tell me what Calvin believed about election? If you can tell me what Calvin believed about election, then I will tell you whether or not I agree with what Calvin said, at least what's in your mind as far as what he said. You see, this is about as, this is about as pathetic of discipleship as I have ever seen in my life. This, these, these men need to be ashamed of themselves for doing this video, for setting their church members up. I don't even, I'm not even sure if they have members, but for, for setting up their congregation, sending them out with that type of pathetic uh, tactic of doctrinal examination of somebody's where they're at. I mean, who does that? That is such a pathetic approach to pastoral ministry and discipleship. These men ought to be ashamed of themselves. The Bible teaches very plainly that we are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. There's no equipping going on here. There's, this is a shibboleth moment. This is just a moment to say, oh, let's see if you fall into this category that my pastor set up, and if you do, I'm out. This is gross Fideism in the church. This is, it is what it is because my pastor said so. My pastor said it, that settles it. Folks, that's not Christianity. That's called Fideism. And that's not honoring to God. We are called to be Bereans. We are called to study, to show ourselves approved, to rightly divide the word of faith. We are to understand the times. We are to be students of history, students of theology. We are to study the ancients. We are to study wisdom. We are to get knowledge wherever we can. That's what the Proverbs say. Gather wisdom, gain knowledge, gain understanding. That's not understanding. That's just that's just somebody giving somebody a a a, a formula to to control them. This is just mind control, pure and simple. 
it's really sad. I feel really, really bad for the people that go to that church. Again, I hate to think of my father that way. That he has created the majority of people to burn in hell, am I not right? And he's glorified in that. They have no choice. I said this to Jim, and I'm going to turn it to him. You don't know if your kids are chosen, because it's unconditional grace. You don't know. If I looked at my kid, and I thought he wasn't chosen, he's going to go to hell, you know what I would do? I'd say, if it's okay with you, I'm going to hell with my kid. Amen. How many parents would do that? I'm going with them. If they have no choice, I have no choice. And that's the now, I, lis I listened to the video very carefully at that point. And when he said, how many parents in here would say that? It was pin drop quiet. <clears throat> because what this pastor did there is he asserted his own infallibility of theological knowledge. He basically assumed the position of an infallible arbiter of theological truth. And the people, I think, that have any godly conscience left stood there and thought, what if he's wrong? Am I really prepared to stand here and say, I will go to hell because Pastor Ron cannot be wrong? I think a lot of people, their conscience right at that moment kicked in. And if there are genuine believers there, I think the Spirit forbade them from making such a foolish, rash, and irresponsible statement. Um, it also shows me where these men are coming from. This is not an exercise in theology, you guys. This is an exercise in pure emotional vomiting. This, these men are simply emotionally exasperated. They have no theological aptitude to deal with these issues. And so they're dealing with it in the only possible way that they know how, not exegetically. They're matter of fact, Pastor Ron is going to go on to define what he believes the word exegesis means. And by then, we will all know, no wonder you're in the position where you're at. <laughs> because his definition of exegesis is patently false, which just shows us this, this group of pastors, perhaps they have a very telegenic influence, perhaps they are very magnetic people to some folks, and they attract people to them, um, but they're not students of Scripture. That's very easy to discern. There's so many dead giveaways in this presentation that these men do not take serious, uh, they don't take Bible study serious. They've never done any real serious Bible study or exegesis of the text, and that comes out over and over again. Um, it's amazing, but, you know, the, the reality is, is that um, they have not thought even philosophically through the, the, the statements that they're making. The idea, well, perhaps my children are not elect. That's right. Perhaps they're not elect. And Jesus has already told his disciples, you're not worthy to be my disciple if you put your family above me. And that is a cost that every disciple must be willing to count. Do you love the Lord your God more than these? Do you love the Lord your God more than anyone else? More than your family, more than your spouse, more than your more than your parents, more than your children, more than anybody, do you love the Lord your God? And I don't know if these men do. Um, it sounds to me like they have put conditions upon God. God, um, if you do not save my family, I have no no I have no desire to be in heaven with you. I rather go to hell than to be with you in heaven. If you won't say, and they and and they somehow think that free will rescues them from this type of philosophical dilemma. So let me get this straight. What you're saying is, God, if you don't choose my kids to go to heaven with you, then I'm I'd rather burn in hell. I'd rather burn in hell and curse you for all eternity than to go to heaven with you. 
But somehow God is justified in giving them free will that will inevitably, even though he knew it was going to happen, let's just chase the Arminian logic through, you know, uh, 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 consistently. So you're going to hand them, you're going to hand a child a gun called free will. You're going to let him put it to his head. And you, you who are powerful enough to do anything you want are not willing to take that gun out of my child's hand, save him from himself, and therefore let him go to hell? How is that any different in a philosophical way? But of course, we are not first and foremost philosophers. We are first and foremost exegetes. We are fo- first and foremost biblicists. And we follow the thoughts of God after him, or we follow our own thoughts after our own likeness to our own detriment. And that's why this gentleman is in the detriment that he's in. That's why he's gotten him like Roger Olson. If that is the way God is, he is a monster, I will not worship him. That is not the mind of a disciple. The mind of a disciple says, God, whoever you are, However you have revealed yourself in Scripture, I will worship you because you are the true and living God. You are omniscient. You're the creator. I'm the creature. You're transcendent. You are infinite. Your wisdom knows no bounds, knows no ends. Who am I to question the Almighty? You cannot contend with God. You can't question God. Who are you? Who is the? What is the clay to say to the potter, why have you made me thus? Who are you to tell God how to structure and ordain the economy of his universe? We have to put our hand over our mouth, stay silent, and just confess. The just judge of all the earth will do right. And if that is not enough for us, then let us put our hand over our mouth and stay quiet. But let us never engage in... uh, demanding that God conform to our ideals of right and wrong, our ideals of fairness, because we don't know what is fair. We don't know what is right and wrong, apart from the wisdom and knowledge of God himself. When in the Old Testament, Moses said, if you take their name out of the book of life, take mine out too. I will tell you now, If they're right about that God, if they were right, which I know they're not, but if they were right, that God creates people to be suffer in hell and gives them no choice about it, I will choose to go to hell with those other people. I will choose to go. If they have no choice, why should I have a choice? Oh, give me, but it's two of us going. (laughs) But I know that's not my father. That's right. I know it's not. Jim, take off. Yeah, and I was I was going to add to that, um, and you mentioned this from the get go is that their interpretation of God in that light is that not only is he going to choose who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, but he's glorified in that. And I want to reemphasize that because the one thing that we do know and that the Bible makes very crystal clear on is that God is love. He is the essence of love. He is the character of love. And uh, 1 John spells that out for us. So everything that we view of God has to stem from that idea that he is love. Matter of fact, uh, on Sunday, I I believe I touched on it last Wednesday uh, when Pastor Ron was in Vegas, is that what we know to be true about God is found in Jesus Christ. In Hebrews chapter one, we covered that last week. And, And so what I have a difficult time with is this view of God that is being distorted. And we're gonna get to that uh, in one of the points in, in a moment. But what you have to do as a person that believes in God and reads your Bible and studies the Bible is that the invisible God has made himself visible through his son, Jesus Christ. So everything that is consistent with Jesus Christ in doctrine is true. Everything that is inconsistent with Jesus Christ in doctrine is false teaching. Well, and hold so on a second there, to, because we have to we have to make sure that uh, we understand what's being said here. Two things. Number one, again, um, these pastors are saying that the love of God is the hermeneutical key 
through which you interpret everything. And we've already learned that it is not the theology of the love of God. It is your understanding of the love of God. In other words, the love of God must be this way or else what is being said cannot be true. And so their presupposition, their approach is all wrong. The other thing that's being said is that everything has to be interpreted in terms of the character of God through the person of Jesus Christ. I don't disagree with that. Jesus is um, the embodiment of deity. In Christ, we see the, we see the Father. In Christ, like Jesus said, we have a perfect representation of the Father. When he tells Philip, Philip, you've known me for so long. Have you not known the Father? Of course, Jesus is a perfect reflection of God, all that it means to be God. But we'll touch on more of those issues uh, right after this break. This is Emilio Ramos with Red Grace Media. I want to talk to you today about the Compelled Conference with Hearts for the Lost. Compelled is a large format conference that provides your church with biblical evangelism training and equips your congregation to become active in the local church's community outreach. If you have an interest in hosting a Compelled Conference, please see my friends at heartsforthelost.com for further details. This is Emilio Ramos with Heritage Grace Community Church in Frisco, Texas. If you're looking for a church in the Dallas area that focuses on expositional preaching, heartfelt worship, and meaningful fellowship, please visit us at heritagegrace.com. We hope that you consider joining us for Sunday worship. Our corporate worship starts at 2.30. We also have Sunday schools at 1.30. Please, if you're in the area, consider joining us this Sunday. Hope to see you there. Well, welcome back, everybody. We've been interacting with a video that was put out by VBF Church, um, a Bakersfield church with satellite campuses all over uh, the place, I think, in Vegas as well. Also, um, this uh, video that's come out is a video that was compiled by two pastors from uh, VBF, and that is uh, Ron Vetti and uh, Jim Cruz. Um, we have been very disappointed, of course, in what they've put out because it has been a complete misrepresentation of the doctrines of grace, of what historic Calvinism teaches. And so we've been interacting a little bit with it here. You know, there are far better voices on this issue. Even if you don't, even if you don't agree with Calvinism, there are far better voices that you could be listening to, obviously, in regards to there's serious scholarship out there. There are people that are actually... Um, a bit more respectable than this. Um, obviously, Roger Olson would be one uh, who is an arch enemy of the Reformed faith, but who at least engages things on a more meaningful level uh, and doesn't caricature everything that he says, at least. So, But anyway, we have been interacting with this video because it was put out in public and for the congregation uh, to see and... Um, they have called out certain people in the Reformed faith. John Piper, the Gospel Coalition, the Acts 29 movement, somewhat Reformed Acts 29 movement, but it is ultimately an indictment against historic Calvinism. And uh, it is ultimately a slander fest. This is what it is. It has just been one slander after another. Of course, it's all the old, um, uh, the, the same arguments that we've always heard, the tired arguments of, you know, uh, uh, the Calvinist God is a monster, the idea of double predestination, the idea of uh, Calvinism doesn't evangelize, don't evangelize, uh, Calvinism is uh, detrimental to the whole purpose of evangelism, things like that. And it's all been rooted in just emotionalism and psychological manipulation, really. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to I'm going to we're going to take uh, one more clip here and interact with it and then we'll close things out. View Jesus Christ and the view of love in order to accept or reject any kind of idea of God that somebody gives you uh, through commentary or, or even a teaching. Tell them about the house on fire analogy. Yeah. Well, before I, he uh, goes to the house on fire analogy, important to point out what he just said there. Basically, what he is saying is that the hermeneutics that he is instructing his people to embrace is basically the picture of Jesus that we have given you. So basically, what he's saying is, if the doctrine does not conform 
to the Arminian Jesus that we have taught you, then it ought to be rejected outright. That is to say, don't let people take you to the Bible. Just remember, see, this is the type of manipulation that we're dealing with here. What they would basically be telling their parishioners is, just remember the Arminian Jesus that we presented to you, and if anyone comes along preaching another Jesus, to pardon the pun, then you should reject that vision of Jesus outright. Don't interact with the Bible. Don't go to Scripture to try to figure out if the person is giving you an accurate uh, theological point of view on anything. Basically, we have already told you Jesus is love, and he loves everybody indiscriminately. He loves everybody equally, and he wants to save everybody equally. And basically, Arminianism is who Jesus is. And if anybody comes to you with a different vision of that, then don't engage in Bible discussions with them. Just reject it. Or as the pastor himself said, and we'll go on to say, we'll go on to reiterate, just ask them, do you believe in election the way that John Calvin did? These type of shibboleth moments where these little, these these sort of, uh, uh, these diagnostic questions that you're supposed to ask folks are just really cheap, um, underhanded ways of controlling and manipulating your people. And it's really, really sad. That's all the time uh, that we have today to interact with this video. I just want to stress that we are going to continue to um, to interact with the video. And next week, Lord willing, um, we are going to we are going to interact with the texts that they supply for their supposed rebuttal and refutation of the doctrines of grace. So we'll go pretty much scripture by scripture, um, examining the verses that they supply and that they claim, of course, to refute Calvinism. Um, we will look at those texts next week. Thank you for listening um, to this edition of Red Grace Radio. Be sure to tune in also to On the Brink, Christ and Culture, where I interact with cultural uh, trends and news in popular media and how that affects the church and what uh, and what the, the, the evangelical response to cultural trends should be and things that we ought to be uh, thinking about as a church. And also, be sure and prayerfully consider supporting us. This is a listener-supported ministry, so please prayerfully consider supporting us, praying for us, as we continue to examine all things evangelical, evangelistic, and reform. God bless you. This was a production of Red Grace Media. Be sure and visit us on facebook.com slash redgracemedia and on Twitter at redgracemedia. Be sure and take advantage of our media resources on redgracemedia.com where you'll find articles, audio, and videos on a wide range of theological subjects. Also visit our bookstore for all of your theological resources. We hope you've been encouraged by today's program, and please remember to pray about supporting us so that we can continue to magnify the redemptive grace of God in Christ. Thank you.